Welcome to our live webcast, Progress in Amyloidosis 2022. Thank you for joining us. My name is Jackie, and I'll be the operator for the presentation today. Before we get started, I'd like to take a moment to acquaint you with a few features of this web event technology. At any time, you may adjust your audio using any computer volume settings that you may have. On the right-hand side of your screen, you will see the text chat window. There is a large window which holds all of your sent messages and a smaller text box at the bottom where you will type in your question. To send a question, click in the text box and type your text. When finished, click the Send button. All questions that you submit are only seen by today's presenters. Your questions will be responded to in the order in which they were received and will be addressed at the end of the presentation. We are joined today by our speaker, Dr. Jeffrey Zonder, who is a professor in the Departments of Oncology at the Barbara Ann Carmanis Cancer Institute and Wayne State University School of Medicine. He is the leader of the KCI Multiple Myeloma and Amyloidosis Multidisciplinary Team and co-leader of the Molecular Therapeutics Program. He is a member of the steering committee of the Multiple Myeloma Research Consortium, a medical advisor for the Amyloidosis Support Group Networks. Dr. Zonder is a member of the International Myeloma Working Group, the International Myeloma Society, and the International Society of Amyloidosis. He is a member of the Southwest Oncology Group's Barlogi Salmon Myeloma Committee. Dr. Zonder has authored or co-authored numerous original research papers, review articles, book chapters, and research abstracts on myeloma and amyloidosis. Dr. Zonder, the time is now yours. Thank you so much. I uh, appreciate the invitation uh, to join uh, all of you today and to uh, review uh, recent advances uh, in the field of amyloidosis um, I want to uh, thank our sponsors for their generous support of this program, and these include Elnylam and Prothena. These are my relevant disclosures or my uh, conflicts of interest, and as you'll note, um, both of the sponsors of this program are, are listed. I've done some advisory work for them. Uh, at all times during this presentation, uh, in both the AL amyloidosis and transthyretin amyloidosis portions of the talk, uh, I will uh, be as clear as possible about which therapies are approved and what their indications are uh, and which uh, agents uh, I'm discussing are uh, uh, used in an off-label fashion. Uh, today, uh, during this talk, uh, I first will describe recent advances in the management of AL or light chain amyloidosis. Then we'll move on to a review of uh, therapy, including approved therapies for ATTR or transthyretin amyloidosis and how those therapies work. Uh, then we'll discuss new classes of agents designed to help remove existing amyloidosis deposits. Uh, so let's start with uh, AL or light chain amyloidosis. The first thing to understand about this condition is that this is a plasma cell disorder. And by that, I mean there is an overgrowth of an abnormal population of plasma cells, typically in your bone marrow. Uh, and these uh, cells make misfolded light chains. Now, uh, I'm going to talk a little bit more about how we think about light chains, but in principle, light chains are fragments of antibody proteins. And each plasma cell in our bone marrow makes antibodies or the light chain fragments of antibodies of one type, uh, either kappa or lambda. Okay? That's going to be important later. So what we see here is an overgrowth of plasma cells. There's an excess of the cells that make lambda-type light chains, and you can see that the light chains in this cartoon are predominantly lambda. And these misfolded light chains first start forming uh, these these uh, clumps that are still soluble in our blood, uh, and these misfolded light chains and the toxic uh, uh, clumps, which are, the, the medical term is oligomer, um, these, these themselves are actually toxic to organs, and there's plenty of information showing that um, the, the contraction of heart muscle is affected by these um, light chains, and also that uh, kidney, uh, certain cells in the kidneys called mesangial cells are injured um, by these uh, soluble light chains. Uh, but then what happens downstream from that is they continue to clump up and they eventually form strands and those strands uh, actually drop out of uh, circulation and get deposited in the tissues of the organs 
and they can actually start causing mechanical interference and damage to those organs. Um, and it really can be any uh, organ. Uh, the symptoms that a person has uh, depends on which organs uh, have uh, these clumps in them. Um, uh, to go into a little more detail about light chains, we already covered the fact that there are two types, kappa and lambda. Uh, and in light chain amyloidosis, again, because there's an overgrowth of a single clone of cells that are either kappa forming or lambda forming in terms of the light chains they produce. Uh, we think of one of the light chains as the bad light chain. We call that the involved free light chain. And the other light chain is the light chain type that normal plasma cells are making. And we call that the uninvolved free light chain. And so in a typical, uh, uh, report that we get, a, a, a blood lab report, um, we, we get a value for, the, capital, for the, the involved free light chain and the uninvolved free light chain, so that you'll get one reading for kappa, one reading for lambda. And our goal of therapy is really to reduce the excess amount of bad or involved light chain, because that one will typically be quite a bit higher uh, than the uninvolved light chain. Um, the report also routinely gives us the ratio of the kappa and lambda light chains, and so you'll see the, the relative amount of the involved free light chain versus the uninvolved that way. But again, because the, um, uh, be, because the uninvolved or normal light chain is often in the normal range, the ratio really is just a reflection of how much extra uh, uh, bad light chain there is. And we really focus on the difference between these. And so we call this the difference between the free light chains or the DFLC. That's going to be the abbreviation that you see on subsequent slides. So when we're, when we're treating light chain amyloidosis, the first thing we're trying to do is get what we call a hematologic response. We want to get a rapid, deep, sustained hematologic response because these light chains that we're measuring aren't just a marker of how many plasma cells you have in your bone marrow. They're, they're actually the, the toxic protein that's injuring your organs. And so we wanna get the, the levels of that toxic protein decreased. So here on this graph, I'm showing you sort of our baseline situation. The, in, the, in this particular uh, uh, graphic, uh, the, the, the difference in the free light chains, the DFLC is measured here with this bar. Now, to say that somebody's had a partial response, we want to see a decrease in that pink bar, the involved free light chain. We want to get that reduced by uh, we want we want to get that reduced so that the difference between these uh, two bars is um, decreased by at least 50%. We call that a partial response. Now, if we can get uh, at least a partial response and the difference between the involved and uninvolved free light chain is four milligrams per deciliter or less. We call that a VGPR. Um, some of you may have uh, seen on your light chain reports uh, different units. Um, some labs reported as milligrams per liter. And so the, um, the difference here uh, would be 40 milligrams per liter rather than four milligrams per deciliter. But still, uh, those are the same. That's just an issue of the units being uh, used. And we call this a VGPR, or very good partial response. And then to say somebody's had a complete hematologic response, we want to see the level of the involved free light chain get to the normal levels, or sometimes even lower. We don't require uh, the, the, the number to be zero because, I mean, there, there may be slight differences between the involved and uninvolved free light chain, but if they're both in the normal range or lower, we call that a complete response. Um, in this complete response category, um, in the past, we've also demanded uh, that, for instance, if the patient has an M protein, uh, which is something we usually see in multiple myeloma, but uh, only sometimes see in amyloidosis, we, we would insist that that disappeared. But in reality, the M protein is less important than the light chain. So when we're talking about a hematologic or light chain complete response, we're really very focused on just these light chain values. Uh, we consider anything above a VGPR or a very good partial response to be uh, what, we, what we'd call 
uh, an acceptable response. And the reason I'm saying that is because the uh, because patient survival is uh, strongly correlated with the depth of response we get. Um, and patients who achieve at least a very good partial response are more likely to have extended survival. And really, uh, the reason for that is because patients who achieve at least a very good partial response are more likely to subsequently have organ responses. And I'm going to get into that in a minute. Um, one thing that in terms of a recent development, we've started looking at super deep or ultra deep responses, something called the minimal residual disease testing. This is testing you can do on somebody's bone marrow uh, that looks for like one abnormal plasma cell out of 100,000 or 500,000 or a million cells. Um, and when I send a patient's bone marrow for minimal residual disease testing, the report I get back typically says, you know, we analyze you know, 1.9 million cells, 2.3 million cells, and this is how many abnormal cells we found amongst those. And, and that's a, a whole different level of response. There are lots of patients who are in a complete hemologic response by the criteria I'm showing you on this slide where the light chains are normal, but they actually still have, you know, um, uh, de detectable cells in their bone marrow. Um, it does seem that those deeper responses may be associated with um, improved outcomes, but uh, the main reason for that uh, isn't because the light chain levels are any lower. It's just that the light chain levels are um, more likely to stay low for a long period of time when you have somebody whose plasma cell clone is deeply, deeply suppressed. So um, I wanna just mention, I wanna get back to the topic of organ response. Okay, and organ response is not assessed uh, solely on blood work, although um, for the major organs mm -hmm. that are affected by AL amyloidosis, um, uh, uh, we do incorporate uh, blood work. Um, for the heart, for instance, we measure NT proBNP serially over time to see if it decreases, and we'd like to see at least a 30% decrease in the NT proBNP. Uh, it's also possible to see echocardiographic improvement. An echocardiogram is an ultrasound of your heart. Uh, I'm gonna go into a little bit of detail about echocardiograms later, but we can assess both the, the pump function of the heart and also the stiffness of the heart. Uh, and we may see improvements um, in either of those features. Um, to assess uh, kidney response, we uh, predominantly are looking at urine protein levels. And we're talking about albumin in the urine, and it's best measured on a 24-hour sample. And again, we want to see uh, a, a significant decrease in the amount of uh, protein that's being spilled in the urine. Uh, and uh, as the amount of protein in the urine goes down, uh, we'll often start to see uh, improvements in the levels of albumin in the blood, because that is the protein that's being spilled. Uh, and as albumin levels come up, um, some problems that patients have, such as low blood pressure uh, or swelling in their legs, uh, may be uh, improved uh, as that happens. Um, finally, uh, when we're talking about uh, assessing liver response, we're monitoring a uh, blood test that's done as part of a routine chemistry panel called alkaline phosphatase. We like to see improvements in that. Uh, occasionally, uh, if the liver is enlarged from amyloid deposits in the liver, uh, one may see uh, improvement in the size uh, of the liver, um, but that's a bit less likely to happen than improvements in the alkaline phosphatase. Um, the, the issues with assessing organ response uh, first is that these can be difficult to apply. Um, certain things like the NT proBNP uh, or the urine protein levels can fluctuate pretty wildly as uh, patients are being treated for reasons that may or may not have to do directly with the amyloidosis. And so uh, you don't wanna hang your hat on any one single reading of, the, uh, of either of these tests. You wanna sort of follow them serially and get a sense over time whether they're improving and on average achieving certain thresholds uh, that are uh, used to define response. Uh, the other thing is that none of these endpoints that I'm showing you here, uh, even though as, as a physician, and, and as a patient, we might agree that these are clinically significant. Um, they're, not, um, they're not right now usable as endpoints for clinical studies 
um, that help drugs get approved. And so it's been difficult to get um, drugs approved because um, of um, difficulty consistently sort of assessing the degree of benefit um, that different therapies offer. Um, the other important thing to understand about organ responses is that they may lag behind hematologic responses by months, sometimes more than a year. Uh, and the analogy, if, if any of my patients are listening uh, to this lecture, um, they've, they've probably heard me use the analogy of a house fire. Okay, so if you think about what happens in a house fire, uh, uh, the night the fire is happening, the fire department comes in and puts out the fire, and by morning, the fire's out, right? That's, that's me coming in with chemotherapy or some other kind of therapy and shutting down light chain production. But the problem with that house fire is that there's been smoke damage, structural damage and smoke damage to the house, and it's actually the smoke damage that makes the house uninhabitable for the next six months, right? It takes a lot longer to repair that damage than it did to put out the fire. And uh, that's, that's kind of the process that we see in amyloid. Getting, getting improvements or repair of organ function takes a really long time. Your body uh, heals very slowly. It is possible to heal, but uh, it can take months. Um, and uh, in the meantime, while we're waiting for that to happen, uh, even as we're, we're giving treatment that's successfully lowering the light chains, it's really, really important to have a multidisciplinary team to help address the symptoms and risks related to advanced organ injury uh, that are often there uh, at the outset of therapy. Uh, I mean, the most striking example of this is heart involvement. When we stage uh, AL amyloidosis, we stage it on the basis of a couple of different blood tests which uh, one is uh, troponins, and there are a few different types of troponin, and one is called um, BNP or, N or NT proBNP, which are two closely related um, um, tests. And basically, you take one of the troponin and one of the BNP uh, markers, and based on whether they're, uh, they, they cross certain thresholds of abnormality or not, uh, we can divide patients up into uh, stage one, two, or three, and then within the stage three group, we can divide it up into a 3A or 3B group, which is kind of like a better uh, stage three and worse stage three. And uh, this predicts survival. And, and the reason your initial cardiac stage predicts survival is because the amount of heart involvement at diagnosis predicts your risk of having certain life-threatening complications early on, even as you're starting therapy, such as congestive heart failure or particularly abnormal life-threatening heart rhythm, uh, uh, heart rhythm abnormalities. So um, it's, it's important. This risk doesn't just immediately evaporate as the light chains do, uh, and it's important to have a cardiologist uh, on board for patients who have uh, advanced symptomatic heart disease, just like it's important to have a gastroenterologist or a nephrologist or a neurologist uh, or other specialists relevant uh, to the organs that are affected for a given patient. Now, now that we've talked about sort of the principles of therapy, let's actually talk about the therapies. Now, this uh, list uh, is uh, not, not exhaustive, but it covers general classes of drugs. And basically, all of these uh, therapies that I've listed here, with the exception of the, the bottom three in the far left orange column, which we're going to get to later, but all of these other therapies are treatments that are derived from our experience in treating multiple myeloma. Multiple myeloma is a cancer of plasma cells where there's a clone of abnormal and aggressively growing plasma cells. And we use these therapies to target the plasma cells, just like we use therapy to target the plasma cells in AL amyloidosis. Um, so um, it's very typical in uh, myeloma, and it's uh, uh, also typical in AL amyloidosis to select drugs from different columns and combine them into regimens uh, to sort of come at those plasma cells from different angles. And so uh, the classic would be one called Cyborg D, which is pulling cyclophosphamide from the purple alkylating agent column, 
bortezomib, also known as Velcade, from the red proteasome inhibitor column, and then D, dexamethasone from the steroid or glucocorticoid column. And so cybor D is really just an acronym for these three drugs. And this is a three-drug combination that we uh, give usually on a weekly basis uh, in four-week cycles. And we've been using this regimen for a long time, and it wasn't approved, but it was a very standard regimen to use. Uh, recently, there has finally been one approved therapy in AL amyloidosis, which is subcutaneous daratumumab, or Darzalex, in combination with Cybor-D. And this was done on the basis of the Andromeda trial, and I'm going to sort of show you that here. So first what we did is we um, uh, did a safety run-in uh, with 28 patients where we just made sure we could safely deliver Cybor-D plus subcutaneous DARA in combination with each other for six months and then give DARA as an ongoing single agent drug as maintenance therapy for a period out to two years. Okay, and just to be clear, daratumumab is an antibody that targets a protein on the surface of the plasma cells called CD38. And it's not the only uh, antibody. Isotuximab uh, also uh, targets the same protein, but uh, Darzalex or daratumumab is the one that was studied in the Andromeda trial. So what we saw was first uh, we could give these agents and that there was no toxicity of this combination that was unique to amyloid patients compared to similar regimens in multiple myeloma patients. Uh, what we also uh, saw was that uh, the overall response rate, that is the number of patients achieving at least the partial response, was 96% with just over half of patients achieving a complete reduction of their light chains, which seemed to be an, an improvement over historical expectations. And then uh, we followed patients during the maintenance portion, and we were um, happy to see that there was no late toxicity related to the daratumumab uh, that would have been unexpected based on what we thought we already knew about it from using it in multiple myeloma. So once we had this information, it led to a randomized trial, um, and um, it looks like the graphics here got a little bit um, turned around, but basically this was a randomization between uh, this combination of Cybor-D plus daratumumab versus Cybor-D alone for six cycles, and then in the group that was randomized to get the antibody up front, they got daratumumab maintenance. So really, it's looking at kind of two questions. It's looking at the uh, efficacy of the initial induction with the antibody added to it versus the regimen without the antibody. And then it looks at um, uh, the, the, the benefit of extended maintenance therapy after that uh, with some limitations that I'll talk about in just a little bit. Um, the primary endpoint was the overall complete hematologic response rate. But a key secondary endpoint was something called MOD PFS, or Major Organ Deterioration Progression-Free Survival. That's a mouthful. So what does that actually mean? So it's something called a composite endpoint where, we, we, where if any one of several things happen to a patient, we consider that to be uh, an event. Uh, and we're tallying the percentage of patients who have any one of these events listed here in one arm of the study versus patients in the other arm of the study. So uh, death or hematologic progression, which means rising light chains, um, either of those things, or heart or kidney deterioration such that it required uh, the certain specific um, interventions like an organ transplant uh, or a ventricular assist device in the case of heart deterioration or initiation of dialysis in the setting of, uh, in, in the case of uh, kidney involvement. Um, so, um, what we saw in terms of the primary endpoint was that the, the hematologic, the complete hematologic response rate was almost exactly what we saw in the safety run-in, 53%, and that was more than double what we saw in the cyborg D alone uh, arm, where the complete hematologic response rate was only 18%. Um, in terms of the um, uh, MOD-PFS, 
uh, we saw that the likelihood of having any one of these uh, outcomes was uh, it really almost half as likely in the group that got daratumumab. And so both the primary and this key secondary endpoint were both strongly positive favoring the addition of um, subcutaneous daratumumab. It should be noted, uh, just you know, for what it's worth, that the difference in hematologic progression uh, really is what drove uh, the difference in the modified PFS. Um, almost all of the patients who had who, who met uh, a criteria for, for progression on this, who, who sort of met criteria for the secondary endpoint, in almost all cases, it was actually due to the light chain starting to go up again, and it wasn't due to differences in any of these other uh, endpoints. Um, particularly, um, uh, any difference in uh, early deaths. So um, uh, the fact of the matter is, is that there was there was no difference in the likelihood of having um, a disease-related death uh, in, uh, in either arm. Um, and um, this goes back to what I told you before about certain types of damage uh, or injury may, may be setting things in motion that are hard to pull out of even with effective therapy. We are hopeful that down the road, we're going to see differences in survival based on uh, the difference that I just mentioned in the rate of um, hematologic relapse. Um, you know, if you can keep the light chains lower longer, chances are you're less likely to run into, um, you're less likely to run into any um, uh, uh, organ deterioration related to amyloidosis. So we're hoping that we're gonna see that down the road. Now, um, patients with the most advanced cardiac disease were actually excluded from the study, so we can't be sure that uh, the benefits that we saw in the study would be extended to patients with more advanced cardiac disease. That's an important thing to understand. Um, the other thing that the study design really doesn't help us with is uh, whether or not those uh, extra two years of maintenance therapy are really necessary. I mean, it is possible that just adding the antibody during induction would have led to the sustained uh, mm -hmm. disease control um, uh, uh, that, um, that we saw, but we don't know that. It, um, another possibility is that it actually was the maintenance, uh, but without a second randomization where patients in each arm either do or don't get uh, maintenance therapy, we really, don't, uh, we really don't know the answer to that question. So um, that's an open-ended question, and it is being explored in amyloidosis and uh, particularly in multiple myeloma as well. So this is kind of a typical treatment algorithm. The first thing we do when we suspect somebody has amyloidosis and we're, doing, we're making the diagnosis is we make sure it's AL type because AL type is the one type where the culprit is these abnormal plasma cells. And since what I just showed you is a whole list of therapies that basically target plasma cells, you want to make sure that that's the type of amyloidosis we're dealing with. Uh, the second part of this talk is going to be about the other most common type of amyloid called ATTR or transthyretin amyloid. And as you'll see, there are specific therapies for that type of amyloidosis, but they're not chemo. And the last thing you'd want to do is treat one type of amyloidosis with the wrong type of therapy because ATTR patients couldn't possibly benefit from chemotherapy and AL amyloidosis patients couldn't possibly benefit from the therapies that are used to treat ATTR. And so we want to make sure that we're starting in the right lane. So once you've clarified that this is AL type amyloidosis, then the standard approved therapy right now is daratumumab and Cyborg-D based on the Andromeda trial. Unless the patient has uh, more advanced cardiac disease, then uh, I'll show you that you might want to modify therapy to something a little bit uh, gentler than this combination. Um, after you've given some therapy, if the patient is having a deep hematologic response from uh, those initial up to six cycles of therapy, then based on Andromeda, you'd probably go to maintenance daratumumab uh, as the next step. Um, if the patient hasn't had a deep hematologic response, then you start needing to think about other therapies. And the other therapies could be any of the other drugs uh, mentioned uh, on that list. Some are used more frequently than others. 
Uh, immunomodulatory drugs such as Revlimid or, pom or Pomalis, those are the generic names are lenalidomide and pomalidomide. They're not approved in uh, AL amyloidosis, but they are uh, therapies that have been approved in multiple myeloma, and we know they're effective at reducing plasma cells uh, burden in the bone marrow. Um, so those could be options. Um, also, high-dose chemotherapy and autologous stem cell transplant where you're using uh, your own stem cells. Um, that's a, a historically very active therapy. And usually at this point, if a patient hasn't had a great hematologic response but is a candidate for that kind of intensive therapy, that's when I'd think about using it. Um, if they're not a candidate for stem cell transplant, that's when I think about other drugs such as the immunomodulatory drugs or uh, another off-label drug called venetoclax. Um, uh, or, or any of the other drugs on that original um, uh, table. And the goal of therapy, uh, as I mentioned, whether it's with first-line therapy or whether it's with any of these second-line options, the goal of therapy is to um, uh, get that nice, deep, sustained light chain response. Uh, now, um, I mentioned that uh, the, the Andromeda regimen, the Cyborg D plus DARA, um, hasn't really been studied uh, in detail in patients with the most advanced cardiac disease. And so uh, it may be uh, preferable to sort of tease apart the regimen and use either the Cyborg D or the Daratumumab, or maybe Daratumumab with parts of the Cyborg D regimen, like just Bortezomib, but maybe not all of the drugs in the regimen. Uh, to try and sort of finesse an early response while patients are sort of in a fragile uh, state related uh, to uh, their advanced cardiac involvement. Uh, there is a regimen called RVD, which is Revlimid, Velcade, and Dexamethasone. Revlimid is lenalidomide in, in that family of uh, that other family of drugs I mentioned. This is actually the most commonly used induction regimen in myeloma initially. Uh, and uh, the uh, uh, Greek investigators did look at RVD as induction therapy for uh, AL amyloidosis. And the two things they found out are that it's, um, it is effective at lowering light chains, but it is in some respects more difficult to tolerate than Cyborg D. Uh, drugs in the lenalidomide, pomalidomide family are a little bit more difficult in patients with uh, advanced cardiac involvement. And so dose modifications are, very, are frequent and necessary. Uh, we actually had a very, very similar experience with the combination of pomalidomide, velcade, and dexamethasone uh, in a smaller trial that we did. So this is typically a, a second line regimen uh, in, in most people's practice, but there is data to show that it can be used up front. And then um, there are some patients, particularly patients with no cardiac involvement in all, at all, and maybe like isolated kidney involvement, uh, might be a good candidate for high-dose chemotherapy and stem cell as their first and only frontline therapy without the need for subsequent, uh, you know, maintenance therapy uh, or uh, antibody therapy. Um, and uh, actually, there is some interest in trying to do a randomized study comparing the Andromeda strategy versus transplant in suitably fit patients, um, and hopefully that will get off the ground. Um, in the past, randomized trials of transplant and amyloidosis have actually been pretty difficult to do, so I'm keeping my fingers crossed, and I'm hoping we are able to do that. Um, on the, uh, the, the treatment paradi paradigm uh, 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 graphic that I showed you, the pathway that I showed you, I did mention in, in, in parentheses during the induction that, that, the, that the Andromeda therapy would be considered standard, but I mentioned some clinical studies, and I mentioned two specific drugs, which are basically uh, antibodies that actually target the, the protein strands um, uh, rather than the plasma cells, right? So, uh, you know, uh, you know, uh, instead of solely targeting the plasma cells and then waiting to see what happens and whether your body can sort of heal, uh, th this, this newer strategy is targeting the plasma cells and simultaneously coming in with a cleanup crew to help uh, create a situation where your immune system is more uh, readily able to find and clear the amyloid fibrils that are deposited in the organ. 
And so uh, one such antibody is called CAL-101. Uh, this was uh, studied in a couple of what we call phase one studies, which mostly look at safety. Um, uh, we also are trying to establish dose and schedule in phase one studies. Uh, and in, in, uh, this, in these initial studies, which involved a little more than two dozen patients, we basically found that this CAL-101 antibody targeting the misfolded light chains uh, uh, was, was not particularly toxic. We didn't find any uh, side effects that limited our ability to just keep escalating the dose. Um, and there were no therapy-related deaths. And we got hints that uh, there uh, was uh, actually activity or improvement uh, related uh, to binding the, um, the amyloid deposits. First, uh, there was a patient who developed a rash, and um, on uh, biopsy of the rash, uh, it turned out that the rash was caused by uh, the antibody binding amyloid in the skin and an immune response to that. Uh, so that's evidence that it, um, it, it did trigger an immune reaction against amyloid in the skin. Um, also, uh, patients with heart and kidney involvement um, did show evidence of improvement in the parameters that I mentioned before um, uh, uh, when I was describing organ response, the NT pro BNP uh, in the case of heart and the uh, urine protein levels uh, in the case of um, uh, 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 patients with renal involvement. Now, um, there was another hint that something good was happening in the heart, uh, and it has to do with something called cardiac strain. Uh, this is something that we measure on echocardiograms, and I just want to kind of walk through that a little bit. Uh, this is a cartoon of a heart, and I've sort of lifted the lid off of it so that you can see those bottom chambers of the heart. Those are the pumping chambers of the heart that pump blood out uh, uh, to uh, your, your lungs and then to your body. And uh, if you superimpose the graph on the left ventricle as shown here in this cartoon, and then imagine you had this graph drawn on that chamber of the heart, and then you're looking up at that chamber of the heart from where the arrow is pointing, you get a picture that looks like this. You're looking from the tip of the heart up. The tip is also called the apex. And so what we see here is, uh, pinker or redder areas in the middle at the very tip with more deeply negative numbers. That's the strain, that those numbers are a measure of something called strain, which is how the heart muscle in the wall sort of deforms as the heart is pumping. And what we, the more negative the number, the more normal it is. And so the, the color coding tells us how normal or abnormal the number is. So these bright red um, uh, areas by the middle th that has normal function. But what we can see as we go towards the base of the heart, we start to see less negative numbers and paler colors. Even at the very top, we see a blue, uh, little, a little blue area, which is very abnormal function. And we call that uh, uh, decreased uh, cardiac strain or abnormal cardiac strain. Um, the medical term for this pattern where the tip has normal uh, strain function but the base uh, doesn't, we call it apical sparing. Um, but some people refer to this as a cherry on top um, uh, pattern, it, referring to if you were looking down on a, a cupcake or an ice cream sundae with a cherry in the middle, it sort of has this appearance. And this is sort of typical of amyloidosis involvement of the heart. Um, and so, um, as I said, the more abnormal, or the, I'm sorry, the more negative, the lower the number is, the more deeply negative it is, the more normal it is. And so um, if you look on average what happened in patients in these phase one studies who had abnormal strain to begin with, what you can see is that on the whole, every patient except for one with cardiac involvement actually had improvement in their strain within the first 12 weeks of therapy with just this antibody, suggesting that it was actually helping the body sort of clear out this amyloid and improve cardiac function. And uh, in the same presentation that, that Dr. Bhutani uh, gave, uh, he showed the strain pattern for patients who didn't have heart involvement, and actually that was perfectly flat. So it wasn't that strain just got better in everybody who was treated with this antibody. It got better in patients whose hearts were affected by amyloid deposits and had no effect on the strain of patients whose hearts didn't. So this was actually a pretty promising indicator 
that this antibody might be doing something good. Uh, and um, I'll, I'll talk to you about the studies that have been um, that are ongoing with this now. I do want to brief before we talk about that. I want to talk about a different antibody called pertamimab. It used to be called NEOD001, and we did a phase one two study where we looked for uh, dosing. Uh, we found that it was safe, like the other antibody is. This is a different antibody that targets amyloid protein. And what we could see here, just like what we saw with the Cal 101, is that some patients with heart involvement had uh, evidence of organ improvement, and some patients with um, uh, kidney involvement had evidence of uh, organ improvement, including a, a few patients who had a complete resolution of uh, the protein leakage uh, that they had been showing in their kidneys when they were enrolled on the study. So this generated a lot of enthusiasm and uh, led to a couple of randomized trials, a phase two trial called the PRONTO trial, in which this antibody was used um, after patients had completed whatever therapy they were gonna get. At the time, it was Cybor-D, because cybor d wasn't um, typically being used at that point. Um, so patients who had already completed their chemo uh, still had evidence of heart uh, uh, issues, were randomized to the antibody or not, and then um, they were followed. Um, and then there was a, a different study, a larger study called the VITAL trial, in which uh, antibody, pertamimab, was combined with Cybor-D versus uh, just Cybor-D alone. Uh, and uh, the smaller trial read out first and unfortunately surprised us and was negative. And because that trial did not show an improvement in heart function after 12 months of therapy compared to uh, placebo patients, there was an early analysis of the VITAL trial. And I'm, I'm going to go through some of the findings, but what they concluded was that mathematically it seemed virtually certain that the endpoint of the trial, the primary endpoint of the trial, was not going to be met. And so they recommended stopping the trial. Um, the, um, uh, after the vital trial was closed, there was a hard look at the data. And um, what, it, you know, what, what was already known, even when it was closed, was that there was actually a slight reduction in deaths and hospitalizations favoring the antibody. But again, the difference wasn't uh, large enough that it would have met like mathematical definitive certainty that it was actually better and not just a matter of luck. And um, it actually uh, mostly had to do with the control arm doing a little bit better than expected. Um, and so because the difference wasn't as big as expected, uh, that became an issue. Um, but when they actually looked at the patients who had the worst heart involvement, which you'd think might be the patients who uh, uh, would be most likely to benefit from the addition of the antibody, sure enough, there actually was a difference favoring the addition of the antibody. So this actually led to a revitalization, no pun intended based on the name of the original trial, but a, a, a reopening uh, of uh, work with this antibody because for a second it was really shut down. Uh, and now there are three ongoing trials of patients with advanced heart involvement using these two antibodies. There are two Cal 101 trials, which are randomized trials of Cyborg D plus DERA with or without uh, Cal 101 uh, in uh, two, two different groups, one with 3A disease and the, the importantly, one with 3B disease, which is, uh, it's, is important because first, um, uh, uh, analyzing them separately uh, reduces the risk of failing to prove that there's benefit in less involved, uh, you know, heart, in patients with less involved hearts. Um, but also, it would, it, if positive, it would set up de uh, defining therapy uh, in, a, in a patient subset that the Andromeda regimen is not actually currently approved for. Likewise, the bertamimab uh, a study is a randomized study of induction chemotherapy with or without bertamimab, and also for patients with extremely advanced um, heart uh, disease. Uh, they, they're using a different cardiac staging system, but it's, it's, a, it's a group of patients very similar to Mayo stage 3B patients, um, uh, and um, 
again, important because this is a really, uh, this is a patient uh, group really in, uh, in need of new therapies. So uh, this is sort of uh, where the field is at uh, in terms of induction therapy uh, in AL amyloidosis. And now what I want to do is switch gears and I want to talk about the other totally unrelated kind of amyloidosis, which is called ATTR or transthyretin amyloidosis. So the first thing to make sh sure that we're all clear on is that ATTR amyloidosis is not a plasma cell disease. Uh, transthyretin is a protein made in the liver, and um, it is possible, uh, it, well, and there, there are two general types of ATTR amyloidosis. One is um, where uh, a person inherits a mutation in one copy, one gene copy of the transthyretin protein, and having that mutation causes a portion of their transthyretin to misfold. And there's actually over 120 different mutations known to cause ATTR amyloidosis. And then there's a second type called wild type ATTR, which is age related and typically has, uh, occurs in, in um, uh, patients in their 70s, 80s, 90s. Um, and there's no mutation, um, but um, something in their body changes which causes um, uh, otherwise normal uh, transthyretin protein to start misfolding and uh, forming uh, amyloid clumps. So um, I want to just sort of talk about the biology a little bit. And, and it's a little nerdy and bear with me, but the reason I want to talk about it is because it helps us understand um, how different therapies work and why why we use them in different circumstances. So when when our liver makes transthyretin, it makes it makes these protein chains, these single protein chains called monomers. Monomers means single units. And what these monomers want to do is sort of self-assemble into four packs called tetramers, um, like, the, like that old video game that many of us have played, Tetris. Uh, tetramers means four packs. And it's those four packs that are sort of like the functionally active form of transthyretin. And normal transthyretin uh, is uh, important in vitamin A transport, uh, uh, thyroid uh, hormone transport, and it's these tetramers that circulate in our system as a sort of shuttle protein carrying other things around uh, where they're needed. Now, in the case of mutated transthyretin, what happens is one copy of your transthyretin gene is abnormal, and so you get a, miss, uh, a mix, rather, of normal transthyretin monomers and abnormal misfolded transthyretin monomers. And these can also form tetramers that do their job, but the tetramers aren't quite as stable, and so you have um, more monomers circulating. And the monomers or the single isolated chains that aren't in four packs, those are the ones that start forming the soluble clumps of amyloid, and then eventually those strands and, and, and deposits of protein that get into your organs. So once you start shuttling down this part of the pathway and you start forming these amyloid clumps, it reminds us a little bit of what happens in AL amyloidosis. The difference is um, these clumps are made out of trans misfolded transthyretin molecules instead of misfolded light chains. This graphic isn't exactly perfect um, because it is also possible to incorporate some normal transthyretin into these clumps, but the key is it's, the, it's still the monomers, not the tetramers. So um, we have different classes of therapies uh, shown here. This is a, a table sort of like uh, what I showed you for AL amyloidosis. And what we have uh, are... Um, uh, classes of drugs that interfere with this amyloid forming process at different stages. And what I really want to focus on initially are the blue column, which are tetramer stabilizers, and the green column, which are RNA-directed therapies. Um, and um, tofamidus is an approved therapy. There's two formulations of it. One's called Vindicel, one's called Vindamax. These, this is in the tetramer stabilizer uh, column. Uh, and 
And then there's an off-label drug called ziflunazole, which is a non steroidal anti-inflammatory that uh, is also in this same general family of drugs, but it's really a, an off-label repurposing of a drug that was not approved originally for this purpose. And then there's the RNA-directed therapies in the green column. Uh, and the three that are approved are Patisaran, which is also called uh, Onpatro, Vutrisaran, uh, and that's our very recent approval, and that's called Amvutra, and then Inotersin, which is also called Tegseti. So uh, I'm going to focus on those initially, and then we're going to start talking about some of these other uh, therapies uh, after that. So um, tetramer stabilizers um, affect amyloid formation and at amyloidosis here. And, you know, I mentioned before that um, monomers are the, 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 the protein form that get incorporated into the amyloid fibrils. And so the strategy here is basically to uh, keep the, uh, the amyloid, uh, the, the transthyretin molecules uh, packed into four packs where they can't be readily incorporated into amyloid. So we're trying to stabilize uh, the, the four pack and reduce the amount of misfolded monomers uh, to get incorporated downstream. And Tefamidus does this, uh, and it is approved for uh, transthyretin uh, uh, amyloidosis with cardiac involvement uh, on, uh, um, on the basis of this um, large randomized study, which looked at a couple of different doses of tefamidus compared to placebo, uh, and which showed that a composite endpoint that looked at um, survival, but also um, the risk of being hospitalized for uh, cardiac indications uh, was improved in patients that were treated with tefamidus, uh, leading to the approval of this drug. Um, Diflunazole, as I mentioned, is uh, uh, not approved in this indication, but actually stabilizes the tetramers uh, very similarly uh, to um, uh, uh, tefamidus. Um, Diflunazole, uh, there have been shortages of the drug. Uh, there are also some side effect issues with the drug, um, specifically uh, worsening of edema because of um, fluid retention, uh, and also, um, it can be difficult on kidney function and on the stomach, like any non-steroidal. So uh, not quite as easy to use, perhaps, as tefamidus, but available uh, uh, potentially for patients who, for one reason or another, um, are unable to be treated with tefamidus. Um, and there are other, um, there are other treatments um, in development right now that are also uh, tetramer stabilizers, and those are shown here. Now. Another potential strategy would be um, simply reducing uh, the production of misfolded transthyretin, and that's actually the basis of liver transplant. Um, uh, patients with uh, a mutation in transthyretin, their livers are making uh, an abnormal uh, su a supply of abnormal misfolded transthyretin, and if you could replace their liver uh, with uh, a normal liver, uh, whose uh, hepatocytes or liver cells didn't have this mutation, then the transthyretin that they'd make uh, would be all normal transthyretin, and that would reduce the, um, uh, the production of amyloidosis, right? Um, and, and that has been used uh, uh, historically, um, but there are limitations. I mean, the first um, is that even though it does modify uh, the, the, the course of amyloid production, um, uh, it is um, uh, and 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 reduces the production of misfolded transthyretin. Uh, you still have production of transthyretin. It's just normal transthyretin. It's not uh, misfolded transthyretin. Uh, um, and uh, w one problem, though, is that um, it's really. Uh, you have to be suitably fit to get through a liver transplant. And so uh, younger patients with earlier stage disease are the ones who are uh, most likely to be candidates for this. If you have advanced heart involvement or you're older and have other uh, medical issues, this might not be surgery that you're fit for. Um, 
Um, I mentioned before that normal transthyretin can be incorporated into amyloid fibrils, and so there have been numerous cases noted of patients who, um, you know, have organ seeding by uh, amyloid fibrils, and then the normal transthyretin that a transplanted liver produces uh, continues to actually slowly be incorporated into those amyloid fibrils, and you do have continued organ progression. Uh, that's not universal, but it's definitely noted. Um, and then um, the other thing, uh, the other the other things to consider is that uh, after transplant, uh, you know, you need to be on um, immunosuppressive medications. Um, you're at risk for infections. There's a lot of medical follow-up. Um, so there are some quality of life issues after liver transplant. And also, there just aren't enough livers to go around. And the, there are many patients with um, ATTR amyloidosis or other um, life-threatening uh, liver problems uh, who uh, don't uh, survive uh, to get an organ that they desperately need. So um, while liver transplant can be beneficial, it is not uh, by any stretch a universal home run. And so the question is, you know, a, a, a one thought would be, could you in some way um, uh, trigger a targeted reduction of misfolded protein production without having to do a liver transplant? And if you could uh, do this in ATTR amyloidosis, could you then extend this, this therapy strategy to other types of amyloidosis? Well, it, it turns out that there are um, um, therapies that do exactly this. Um, and this is super slick therapy. This, this to me, when this was first developed, I mean, this felt like science fiction to me, and it is really um, a, a game-changing sort of therapeutic strategy uh, in uh, HATR amyloidosis. Um, just to briefly review how proteins are produced, uh, DNA is what has your genes, and that has the template for making something called uh, RNA. Um, the process of using the DNA template to make RNA is called transcription, and then that mRNA is used as the template to make a protein, and that's called translation. And after the protein is made, then there's all sorts of modification and folding, and, uh, and, and that's, that, that's sort of the mature functional protein. And what, um, what this general class of therapy is, which is called RNA interference therapy does, is it hits protein production at the RNA stage. And as you might imagine, every protein has its own DNA template in your chromosome somewhere. And so the mRNA that's formed for transthyretin is very, very specific. It's, that is the mRNA for transthyretin, but not for other proteins. And because it's a specific sequence, uh, like any code, you can target that sequence uh, with something that fits the sequence or binds to the sequence, but doesn't bind to the sequence of other proteins. And so you can really isolate the mRNA uh, of transthyretin specifically and leave the uh, mRNA that liver cells are producing for other proteins alone. Uh, and the therapies that I mentioned in that uh, middle column, uh, which include inotersin, um, uh, patisseran, and vutriseran, although they, they target the uh, mRNA by slightly different mechanisms, um, inotersin is, an, is, is in a class of drugs called an antisense oligonucleotide. Patisseran and vutriseran are in a class of drugs called small interfering RNAs. Um, but, uh, but functionally, what both of them do is they lead to degradation of the RNA for just transthyretin, no other proteins. And by doing that, they basically block production of the protein, and it leads to uh, decreased uh, uh, production of transthyretin protein downstream. And um, the interesting thing about this, although, is, is that although it's very specific for transthyretin, it's not specific for just misfolded or mutated transthyretin. So general levels of transthyretin, both normal and abnormal, do go down with these therapies, and it 
uh, addresses the potential issue that I mentioned uh, with liver transplants, uh, that you, you, know, you still have uh, um, uh, normal production of non-misfolded transthyretin that can still become a problem uh, and be added onto pre-existing amyloid fibrils and organs. Here, you're actually shutting down transthyretin production more um, globally. Um, and uh, this was, I, I, I could show you a very similar picture for um, inotercin, and this is by no means, uh, you know, sh is, is meant to um, signify something specific about pratiseran versus inotercin versus matricerin. This is just um, uh, an example of a phase one study that was done in healthy volunteers using a single dose of pratiseran. Uh, and, you know, the importance that, again, healthy volunteers don't have misfolded or mutated transthyretin. This is basically just showing what happens to transthyretin levels when you give them a dose of patisserin. And basically what it shows you is that once you hit a certain dose level, you get an 80 to 90 percent reduction uh, of transthyretin production that is persistent for 25 to 30 days. Uh, and we don't really see um, the, the, the levels of uh, transthyretin going back up to approaching normal until 40 to 45 days uh, after each dose. So as proof of principle, uh, this is striking. Uh, and this was published in the New, Eng New England Journal of Medicine. And there is a similar paper, for sure, uh, about inotercin, which shows that, you know, a single dose of inotercin also lowers transthyretin levels quite dramatically. Uh, this uh, led to um, um, randomized studies of each of these agents. So patisseran uh, was approved on the basis of a randomized trial um, of patisseran versus placebo with 18 months of therapy. Um, this was called the Apollo trial, and basically this showed improvement in a neurologic endpoint called the modified NIST plus seven, which is not something that is easy to clinically apply, but it was the endpoint for this study, and it's sort of a measure of um, uh, clinical uh, symptoms uh, related to neurologic symptoms. And uh, the historical expectation would be that your NIST score would go um, would, would become increasingly abnormal over time without treatment. Uh, and in fact, in the Patisseran group, we saw stabilization and in some, case, some patients improvement in their NIST plus seven score um, after 18 months of therapy. And that was the basis of uh, improvement in this trial for patients with ATTR amyloidosis with a mutation and nerve involvement due to that, um, that um, mutated Transthyretin. Um, there was a subsequent randomized trial of Vutriseran compared to Patiseran, um, which um, basically uh, showed um, equivalent safety. And then they also compared the efficacy of Patiseran compared to the historical placebo group from this first trial um, and showed that uh, Vutriseran, like Patiseran, uh, led to improvements in neurologic uh, outcomes. Uh, and uh, that led to the very recent, like in June of this year, the approval of Butriseran. Um, the, um, the nice thing about it, and so the advantage of Butriseran compared to Patisseran, um, Patisseran is an IV medication given every three weeks, but Butriseran is a subcutaneous injection given every three months. So quite a bit more convenient for patients. Um, uh, and seems to be uh, similarly efficacious as Pedisran. So both of these drugs are approved for what's called FAP, familial amyloidotic polyneuropathy. So it's patients with nerve involvement, numbness, tingling in their hands and feet, uh, or um, muscle weakness in their arms or legs, uh, related specifically to um, misfolded, mutated transthyretin uh, protein. Uh, now, we also have inotercin, which is also a subcutaneous injection. It's given weekly. There are, are newer uh, drugs um, being developed, uh, just as butriseran was developed after patisseran. There are newer drugs with longer half-lives um, and less frequent dosing being uh, developed uh, uh, in this same family. But this was another randomized study 
of inotercin versus placebo. Again, modified NIST plus seven was the primary endpoint, and then there were several quality of life uh, endpoints. Uh, and this, again, based on the improvement in that endpoint, led to the approval of this drug for the same patient population. Um, again, has the convenience of being sub-Q rather than IV. There are a couple of um, uh, sort of safety monitoring things that are necessary uh, with this uh, agent. Uh, specifically, um, you have to monitor platelet counts because very rarely um, significant decreases in, in, in platelets, which can lead to bleeding, were noted. And also, a very small percentage of patients developed um, some kidney toxicity related to this. And so, protein levels in the urine also need to be monitored with this drug. Um, but again, this is approved for that same patient population, familial amyloid polyneuropathy. So, um, so what we see here... Uh, are uh, two classes of drugs, um, the, the tetramer stabilizers with tefamidus approved, uh, the, um, uh, the um, RNA interference drugs with patisiran, butrisiran, and inotersin approved. Uh, and then we have strategies that target further downstream in the formation, um, uh, notably uh, uh, antibody therapies uh, again, sort of along the lines of what we uh, described for AL amyloidosis, remember we had Cal-101 and bertamimab um, for AL amyloidosis, antibodies that target light chain uh, containing amyloid deposits. Uh, well, there's an antibody called PRX004 um, and other antibodies uh, also noted here, uh, which target amyloid fibrils comprised of ATTR or transthyretin um, protein. Um, and uh, these are currently um, underway uh, in early studies. Uh, and um, uh, we've, uh, th there has been a um, phase one study of PRX004 um, uh, for patients with um, ATTR amyloidosis. Uh, and there are plans underway for more advanced studies to evaluate the efficacy of uh, this agent as a, a, a therapy strategy. Um, so um, that's sort of what I wanted to cover with regards to um, uh, disease process, uh, disease uh, treatment, and uh, monitoring of treatment response for uh, AL amyloidosis and ATTR amyloidosis. Uh, I'll, the, the key points I want you to remember is that we first we finally have an FDA-approved therapy for AL amyloidosis. Uh, we're st uh, this is daratumumab in combination with Cyborg-D on the basis of the Andromeda trial. Uh, we still have the issue of early mortality or early, uh, early risk of death related to advanced heart disease um, that uh, we, we need to address, uh, and newer strategies, including antifibril antibodies to sort of address the advanced uh, organ involvement and to enhance clearance of amyloid from these organs uh, is being pursued as one strategy to address this. Um, uh, and then the other take home point is that therapy for ATTR or transthyretin amyloidosis is evolving really rapidly. Uh, you know, and, uh, and after years of off label, uh, uh, you know, um, anti plasma cell therapy treatment for AL amyloidosis. Um, and then finally, one single approval, uh, that, 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 that's the, the, the evolution of treatment in AL. ATTR had no approved therapies and, and really not any effective therapies other than liver transplant for that fortunate subset of patients who could get it until recently. And now we have this explosion of therapies, including stabilizers uh, and inhibitors of protein production, um, we have the RNA uh, silencing therapies that I mentioned uh, and antibody, uh, antibodies against uh, transthyretin fibrils uh, in active clinical development. And I, I, I kind of I, I glossed over it a little bit, but I have to tell you, when you have a, a, a mutation in a specific gene, it, gene therapy is coming. Uh, and there are uh, ongoing trials. There is a published trial and planned randomized trials of a gene therapy called CRISPR, which basically, uh, instead of using um, periodic doses of a medication like uh, butricerin or inotersin to 
simply, uh, you know, temporarily shut down protein production with, uh, with, with repeated dosing. Uh, there's a form of gene therapy, which basically just permanently knocks out transthyretin production in the liver, and it's a one-time treatment and hopefully will be, you know, permanently disease-modifying. Um, and that's that's coming. That's that is uh, going to be studied, and uh, eventually, uh, if the initial studies are positive, will be compared to these other therapies that I mentioned. So it's a super exciting time uh, in the field of um, amyloidosis research, uh, and um, and there are a lot of really promising therapies that are FDA approved for patients now, and promising therapies available on clinical studies that I would encourage anybody with amyloidosis to um, be on the lookout for. Thank you. Um, uh, as a final closing note, I wanna say, uh, you know, thank you to everybody for participating in our webinar. Um, the Amyloidosis Foundation is a nonprofit organization supporting amyloidosis patients and their families while promoting research, education, and awareness uh, and I, I do have to say the Amyloidosis Foundation uh, is uh, near and dear to our hearts at the Carmanus Cancer Institute, uh, and they have been very supportive of numerous uh, educational programs um, that we've um, organized over the years, and I, I couldn't be more grateful to the Amyloidosis Foundation. Uh, this is the contact information for the foundation uh, if you'd like to reach them, and this is my contact information, uh, my uh, Carmanus um, uh, email address, uh, if you want to reach out to me by email, or my Twitter handle, uh, which proves I'm a total amyloid nerd. So thank you, uh, and uh, I appreciate everybody's attention today. And as a reminder, text chat is located on the right-hand side of your screen. To submit a question, type your question in the small text box at the bottom, and when finished, click the Send button. Please note that due to time constraints, um, Dr. Zonder may not be able to respond to all questions submitted. Um, so the first question, one second here, let me. There we go, Dr. Zonder, now you should be able to speak. I apologize. Okay, um, so the first question is, um, do you want me to read these to you or do you want to read them as you go along, Dr. Zonder? Why don't you? Why don't you read them to me? Okay. Um, so the first question is post-SCT maintenance therapy for dual diagnosis of AL amyloidosis and multiple myeloma. I'm sorry, I don't know how to say that. Equals myeloma. Right, myeloma. Equals Revlimid plus Dara. Um, so there's there's really no consensus on this point. Um, so. Um, it's a, it, so in multiple myeloma, which is plasma cell cancer, where, the, where there tend to be more myeloma cells, uh, more plasma cells in the bone marrow at the outset, and also which tends to have a more aggressive like uh, cell growth pattern, it's very usual to um, treat uh, patients with transplant and then after transplant or, or whatever therapy you use, even after non-transplant therapy, to do maintenance therapy. Um, while there is data on DARA as maintenance in myeloma, the most common maintenance is Revlimid or lenalidomide. Now, the um, um, lenalidomide therapy has been studied in um, amyloidosis, but um, not really in the context of post-transplant maintenance, more just as um, treatment for relapsed disease, uh, and then ongoing use. And what we know about it is that it can be effective, but it's harder for amyloid patients uh, to tolerate, particularly if they have cardiac involvement, uh, than it is for myeloma patients. And so um, we don't really have any randomized data about Revlimid maintenance for uh, amyloid. The only randomized data we have is the DARA. Um, um, so, if we're being, and, and, and the DARA maintenance that's been studied in amyloidosis was not in the context of post-transplant maintenance, but it was in the context of post-Cybor-D plus DARA and then going straight to maintenance after that. 
So it's, it's all sort of extrapolation from one disease to the other. Um, and um, I think there are a lot of people who feel that the field is moving in, in myeloma towards uh, Revlimid and Dara as a combination in maintenance for some people. And so to, to pull this all the way back around to the question that was asked, yeah, Revlimid and Dara, for somebody who has a bone marrow that's cellular the way myeloma is, but who's mostly suffering from the symptoms of amyloidosis, um, Revlimid or Dara or Revlimid plus Dara, all of those could be reasonable um, uh, maintenance strategies. And how I would choose uh, would depend on how completely a person responded to therapy and how they were tolerating therapy. Uh, there is unfortunately no randomized trial to hang your hat on in the, in the setting of myeloma with amyloidosis or just amyloidosis and what you do after transplant maintenance. Um, so um, the, 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 the formal answer to this question is maybe, <laughs> um, but um, it, it is based on um, reasonable and rational extrapolation from other settings where uh, this combo has been studied. Okay, next question. Are there different types of amyloidosis and certain type causes de deposition of, of protein on exterior body only, not on organs? Yes, so um, there are over 30 types of amyloidosis and the way we classify them is based on what the, whatever the underlying protein is. So we talked about two in this lecture. We talked about the AL type where the amyloids made out of light chains that are derived from plasma cells. And we talked about ATTR where the um, amyloid is derived from transthyretin molecules that have misfolded and form fibrils. Um, there are um, uh, cutaneous forms of amyloid. Um, so uh, you can get um, uh, what we call nodular cutaneous amyloid, which is really um, AL amyloidosis localized to just the skin. And it's not the most common site for localized amyloid. Uh, more common sites would be the lungs, the upper airways, uh, the bladder, the urinary bladder, those are more common places to have isolated focal deposits of amyloid. Um, in, in, and in these diseases, the, the, the plasma cells that are making the amyloid are actually right in those organs making amyloid locally, and that's why it only deposits in those uh, organs. So there is a form of skin involvement called nodular cutaneous amyloid. There's also a, a second completely different type called um, uh, a uh, care, a keratin, where the uh, amyloid is the result of um, chronic friction and irritation of the skin, and so people will get it like across their shoulders, across their thighs or, or calves, where like material, uh, you know, like where there's constant rubbing, um, and um, uh, that's called cutaneous amyloidosis um, or, or lichen amyloidosis, and um, that's localized and has no potential to become systemic uh, amyloid. Um, and treatment is um, sort of eliminating the underlying source of irritation. Um, there are other types like uh, APOA1 amyloidosis can, uh, some variants of it can cause thickening of the skin. So yeah, I mean, there are, there are types of amyloid that can cause skin involvement. For how long do you recommend dara, uh, uh, recommend, uh, DARA maintenance therapy? Um, so, um, well, I, if we're going to use maintenance therapy, I recommend that it be used, um, a court, well, it depends. So uh, if we're using it as maintenance after some kind of induction, um, I follow the, um, the Andromeda strategy and use it to out to two years. Um, you know, I have had patients, I mean, uh, one of the first patients with um, amyloidosis that I ever treated with uh, daratumumab, when early data came out about this, uh, this is a person who uh, we were using it as salvage therapy when um, her amyloidosis became a bit more active. And we put her on it, and she tolerates it great, and she's been on it for almost six years now. Um, we, we, you know, every so often we talk about taking a break from it, but at the end of the day, she has hardly any side effects. And um, her disease has been really, really well controlled. Um, so um, I would say that um, if I'm using it in the context of 
post-induction maintenance, uh, I would take it out for two years and then have a conversation about whether or not to continue it then. Uh, and if it's uh, being used as salvage therapy on its own, I tend to use it for as long as it's working and not causing major side effects. Okay, I have Al, Al Kappa and I'm in remission after an autogenous VMT, but if my Kappa numbers are in normal range, 15, but my lambda sometimes goes into low normal range, creating an out of normal range ratio. Is this a concern? Right. So No. The, the short answer is no. This is actually one of the main reasons that we don't uh, like to use ratio as much as difference. In that slide, I, sh I mentioned a pair of slides. I mentioned that the report routinely gives you exactly the information you just offered in your question, but it doesn't give you the difference. Um, you know, when a, a ratio, right, is composed of two different numbers, and if one of those numbers is really, really low, um, you know, um, small changes within that very, very low number can result in huge changes of the, you know, in, the, um, in the ratio. Um, in the example, in this example, let's say um, the lambda light chain was suppressed all the way down to 0.1 as the bottom number. Okay, and the capital H is normal, and the bottom number is 0.1. And then let's say the next time you uh, get the reading, um, the, um, the lambda light chain is 0 0.05, which is even lower below the bottom of normal, and the capital light chain stays the same. The ratio doubled, right, because that number on the bottom was cut in half. The ratio doubled, and nothing changed about the involved light chain that we're worried about. So it just shows you how, how you can skew that ratio wildly with very small changes in the numbers when they're super low like that. So no, we don't we don't worry about that. As long as the um, involved free light chain is in the normal range, uh, we're happy with that. Okay, uh, when will kale be on the market? I hope I pronounced that um, right. You know, uh, hard to know. Um, right now, the um, well, I mean, uh, the short answer is it will definitely not be on the market before these. Uh, uh, two studies are complete. Uh, there's a study for patients with cardiac stage uh, 3A and another for uh, patients with cardiac 3B. And um, one of those studies would have to be positive uh, for this drug to eventually end up on market. Um, both of the studies are accruing, and they're accruing pretty uh, quickly. Um, the stage 3B study is smaller than the stage 3A study because, um, frankly, um, you know, we expect more cardiac events in placebo-treated uh, treated patients, right? Um, you know, the, the rate at which patients have life-threatening cardiac um, events is higher in stage 3B, and so it should be statistically easier to prove that you've made an impact on that. Um, so the studies won't finish at the same time, most likely. Um, my guess is we'll get a readout on the 3B study first. Um, but um, at the rate these are accruing, I would say, you know, we'll be fortunate if we have a readout on these studies in a year. Um, and once we have a readout, um, if, uh, if either one of them is strongly positive and it looks like it's headed for approval, there would probably be some period of, um, you know, open access to the drug, um, you know, um, to um, to facilitate patients getting it while we're waiting for it to get approved. All right. Um, there's a patient that has AL amyloidosis. Why can't I say that all of a sudden? Amyloidosis, amyloidosis at University mm -hmm. of Pennsylvania. Um, organ involvement, heart and kidney have been discussed, but what about the nervous system involvement? Yeah. So nervous system involvement is very common in AL amyloidosis. Um, and, um, but it's very hard to quantify. The, 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 the grading systems that we use are imprecise. Um, we talk about, you know, grade one, two, three, four, and five neuropathy, five meaning fatal neuropathy. Um, but so like one means um, there's symptoms, but they're not functionally consequential, two means their symptoms and there's a little bit of impact on activities of daily living, three means patients are more disabled than that, four means patients are hospital requiring, that sort of, you know, that's, so the, the point is, is that it's 
you can have deterioration within one grade and you don't jump to the next grade, which right there tells you there's a problem with the way we classify it, right? You don't, it's, it's not a, a very fine-tuned system. Um, and then on top of it, we grade like the sensory symptoms on that zero, one to five scale, and then we grade um, motor or strength symptoms on that same scale. And then there's something called autonomic nerves. These are the nerves that, that control your blood vessel tone and heart rate and breathing rate and bowel function and sweating. Um, you know, you also have grading system for autonomic involvement, right? And so, you know, patients can have like grade one sensory with pain and grade two motor and no autonomic and it's, you know, it's, 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 it's complicated to get a global assessment. That's, that's in a way what the modified NIST plus seven was trying to get at was it was trying to ask about a variety of different kinds of neurologic symptoms and sort of compiling it into one big composite uh, score that you could use and the uh, basically, the higher the score, the worse the, the global neurologic function is. And that's really, that, that's what, that was what was used to assess uh, uh, the consequences of neuropathy in the ATTR randomized studies of inotercin, uh, patisseran, and vutriceran. Um, the, the testing that you'd think would be um, helpful in, in getting a more objective measurement, which is nerve conduction studies, unfortunately, uh, often don't correlate very well with the symptoms the patients are reporting. And so for that reason, um, uh, nerve conduction studies, like serial nerve conduction studies are often not done in patients because it's hard to know what to do with the results. Um, how does one get involved with clinical trials? Uh, well. Um, I will tell you that you could go to clinicaltrials.gov and um, search amyloidosis. Um, you could even go so far as to, to do like light chain amyloidosis. Um, if there's a specific uh, drug that you're um, interested in, you can enter. You can do an advanced search and enter in that drug name, and uh, a page will come up for any studies um, uh, involving that drug, and you can see uh, at what locations the, um, uh, the study is being done at. And there's usually contact information for each site. Also, uh, the Amyloidosis Foundation uh, has a pretty good uh, uh, list of what studies are going on where. And there's also an Amyloidosis Research Consortium called the ARC, and they also have a, um, a database of clinical studies. And so the, the short answer is, is using one of these gateways uh, to get connected with somebody um, at a specific center um, to find out about um, the status of a, of, a, of a given study there. Um, if you, you know, if you ever contacted me um, using the um, um, uh, information I provided at the end of the slide deck, um, I would immediately um, forward a query on to um, our um, program manager. Uh, to uh, sort of pre-screen you for potential for studies you might be potentially eligible for. Um, and if I knew we didn't have a study for you, um, I would try to connect you with um, somebody at one of the centers that does. Okay, has the process of testing for ATTR wild type amyloidosis gotten easier and more widespread, especially in patients displaying symptoms of congestive heart failure? And can you describe what tests this process requires? Right. So um, with, with ATTR amyloidosis, there is a, one non-invasive test which is helpful in identifying patients. That's a nuclear medicine uh, uh, bone scintigraphy scan. Um, like a PYP scan is the one that's most commonly used in the United States, which is actually, it was originally developed as a, um, as a bone scan. It's a, um, a radio labeled tracer that's taken up by bone, um, but also it's taken up even more intensely in the heart tissue of patients with ATTR amyloidosis. So um, if you have blood work that doesn't show any sort of M protein or light chain elevation, um, um, and you have a PYP scan that shows greater uptake in the heart compared to the soft tissues of the lungs, 
in the bones in the ribs, that's um, highly suggestive, um, could even be considered diagnostic of ATHR amyloidosis. And then the way you figure out whether it's wild type or hereditary is you do either a cheek swab or a blood test and you sequence the transthyretin gene. So um, it's still somewhat of a diagnosis of exclusion, but this cardiac um, scan has definitely made it a lot easier to make a, a diagnosis. Um, if the scan, if you do this workup and the scan is negative and you still have a very high suspicion, the fallback plan could always be um, an endomyocardial biopsy, which is performed a lot like a cardiac catheterization, except when you're in the chambers of the heart instead of spreading up and injecting dye into the cardiac blood vessels, you just snip a piece of heart muscle from the inside of the heart, and you can take that out and analyze it for amyloid with uh, Congo red staining. Okay, um, next question. Does Onpatro work for cardiac involvement or only neuropathy? <laughs> well, it's not approved for heart involvement. There is data suggest that it may be helpful, and there are um, uh, ongoing but not yet uh, reported studies. Um, I would say I would say enrolled but not yet um, reported studies looking at um, heart involvement, um, and. Um, uh, well, the, the makers of both sets of drugs, the slow interfering RNA and the um, um, uh, antisensitive oligonucleotides, both of them are doing cardiac trials. Uh, and I think the expectation is that um, these could be helpful. Um, it would be surprising if it only, effect, you know, only improved nerve function. Um, the question is, is um, you know, it's. It, it, the question is, how much does it help heart, and is there some subset of cardiac patients that are most likely to benefit, and we'll find that out from these studies. But um, we're, we're going to know a lot more about that very, very soon in the next year. Okay. Um, there's someone who has their father was first diagnosed with AL amyloidosis in 2014. He does have heart involvement with AFib that comes and goes. He had complete response with Velcade, but had a recent relapse about a year ago. Um, they can't remember the new drug combination he's on now, but his light chains seem to be staying the same ranges. At least they haven't gotten worse. At what point would we want to think about other options? Is the goal of treatment to just stabilize or to lower? And then, again, also wondering about any possible new drugs that might be coming out. So the goal of therapy um, should be to get the um, light chain lower if possible. Um, you know, with a, you know, hard to know how hot. You know, I, I'm you know um, not really able to give specific medical advice on specific cases, but in general, um, the goal is to get the light chains lower. If they were rising and then they stabilized with therapy, you did do something with the therapy, and keeping the disease you know, uh, stable uh, might be something, but, um, you know, I think that um, the urgency of switching therapies uh, if the light chains don't go back down to the normal range depends on how early you jumped in sometimes and also whether there was already um, evidence that there was organ deterioration uh, at the time the light chain started rising. Um, if, the, if the heart function or other, other organ function didn't actually worsen, but the light chains were the only thing that were worsening, and uh, we jumped in early and stabilized them, um, that might be sufficient. So it's, it's not a one-size-fits-all, but in general, when we start therapy, we're hoping to see the light chains go down. Now, in terms of um, uh, access to these antibodies, right now, neither company has an ongoing study of um, Cal 101 or um, um, bertamumab um, for the setting you're describing. Um, those studies were done previously. Um, so that was like the Pronto study was patients who had had prior therapy and then um, still had persistent heart involvement. And so they got randomized to placebo or um, bertamumab um, to um, see if that was helpful. And that, that study was actually negative. 
Um, so, um, you know, these, these adjuvant types of therapies that target the fibrils rather than the plasma cells right now are being studied pretty much solely in combination with chemo early. Um, and as far as other investigational agents, like as an example, venetoclax, which is an approved drug in um, non-Hodgkin's lymphoma and CLL, um, but um, not approved for myeloma or amyloidosis, um, but uh, is active in a subset of patients <laughs> that have a certain um, chromosome um, translocation um, that's common in amyloid. And so there are studies ongoing of that, for example, as a newer drug. Um, but um, uh, uh, you know, the eligibility for trials like that um, you know, has to be examined closely for any trial that's being considered. And um, sometimes when a patient is on therapy, um, uh, they, they may or may not be eligible depending on what their current response status is to whatever they're on. I'll, I'll leave it at that. Okay. Um, do you have any idea how long it will be before any anti-fibril antibodies might be approved for general patient population? Um, it'll be at least a year, or if not longer. Okay. Do you have any advice for those of us with the ATPR FAP mutation who do not have symptoms yet? Yeah, so that's, that's very challenging. Um, I think that um, um, and I think that's always sort of the question about getting tested in general. I think it's a very complicated question. And you know you have a parent who has an autosomal dominant disease, which means there's a 50-50 chance it's been passed on to you. If you happen to get the, the bad copy of the ATTR gene instead of the normal copy um, from that parent, um, the, um, the therapies that we have right now uh, are lifetime therapies, and they've only been tested in people who have a certain level of symptom, you know, symptom involvement at the time they entered the study. We don't really have great, um, you know, data to support the use of these agents as a preventative for ever developing symptoms, and they're enormously expensive. You know, and so it's so right now we generally wait until there's the onset of at least a little bit of symptom before um, thinking about using these drugs. Um, not so hard to imagine a future where perhaps if you had a one-time treatment, like gene gene editing, you know, like CRISPR, like if you if you had access to something like that and you could get a one-time sort of fix that would preclude you from ever getting amyloid in the first place. Um, maybe, but right now um, we don't really have the data um, to support uh, using a lifetime, you know, lifelong treatment uh, of injections or infusions for somebody who doesn't have symptoms yet, since there's some possibility you won't develop them. Okay. Uh, are there any updates on CART research for AL? Uh, the only update is that it's there, there's interest in it, but um, uh, CAR-T research is, is way behind any of the other things that we talked about in this study. The, the, I mean, lots of interest, not a lot's been done yet. Okay, um, so we have someone that has wild type and their legs are so weak that they fell and broke a hip. Um, they're wondering if their wild type can be so progress that it would have caused such a weakness? Uh, it's possible. Wild type ATTR generally is more, um, <clears throat> you know, it's thought of as predominantly cardiac, um, but um, there certainly are patients who develop other organ involvement, including nerve involvement. So, you know, <clears throat> the, the problem is, you know, wild type transthyretin amyloidosis uh, tends to occur in older patients, and it tends to occur in patients who may have other reasons to have that kind of leg weakness. And so I'd, I'd want you to be worked up for like spinal stenosis, uh, which, 
can be due to the amyloid, but can also just be due to arthritis. Uh, I'd want you to be, um, um, you know, you, you, you might need to look at medication lists, see if you're on any medications which could be affecting muscle strength. Um, you know, I think you need to have a sort of a, a, a general medical workup to figure out why your legs are weak. Um, it may turn out to be amyloid, but, but there's, there's so many other things that can also cause symptoms like that um, that, um, you know, you, you want to rule those out to the extent that you can. All right. Is there any data on the efficacy of acoramidus? Um, short answer, there is some data. I don't have it at my fingertips, but I can find that data and send it. Uh, probably the easiest thing would be for me to send it to uh, um, uh, the uh, organizers of this um, uh, symposium, this webinar, and then we can uh, have it forwarded on to um, the participants. Okay. Uh, next question, okay. does Vanamax halt the production of all the proteins or just misfolded ones for wild type? So actually, Vanamax doesn't, doesn't affect um, amyloid production. What it does, or transthyretin production, <coughs> what it does is it actually stabilizes um, the amyloid that's produced uh, in a form that is harder to actually incorporate into the amyloid fibril. So it's, it's more likely to stay in the functional four pack that, that drags around other proteins um, like um, vitamin A and um, thyroid um, hormone. Right? So it, um, that's, what it, that's what its job is. And so if you can keep it in that four-pack formation, it's, it's less likely to be incorporated into amyloid fibrils. So if you actually measure um, uh, transthyretin levels after starting somebody in Vindamax, it either stays the same or it even goes up slightly because you're not funneling the transthyretin down into this sink of amyloid fibrils. When, when transthyretin gets produced and turns into fibrils, it drops out of circulation, so you're not measuring it in the blood anymore. If you stabilize it as tetramers, it stays in the blood where you can actually measure it. But, it's, but, it's what, but the formation that it has in the blood is safer in, when, you're, when you're on Vindamax. So it, it doesn't lower production. It doesn't have an effect on the liver. It has an effect on the, the folding pattern and um, circulating form of um, the transthyretin after the liver has formed it. Okay, are any of the treatments um, able to reverse the damage done to the heart by wild type ATTR? Uh, for example, removing the folded amyloids and allow the heart to heal? Um, I can't tell that this question is really meant for wild type ATTR. Um, is, is, that, is this a question from Kenton Peters, too? Oh, um, the, down further, they said I'm referring to wild type ATTR. Oh, yeah. Um, uh, the short answer is um, wild type ATTR patients weren't included in these studies of the, um, you know, they were excluded. So, um, so we don't we don't have definitive data on RNA targeted agents yet, but we will. I think there's some expectation that we'll see some improvement in some patients. Um, we do have you know like the Cal 101 data from in AL amyloidosis, which shows that an antibody that binds uh, fibrils and, and soluble misfolded clumps um, did improve cardiac strain. So that suggests that there's a good impact on the heart. And if we can extrapolate from AL to other types of amyloid, maybe uh, getting rid of those, say, those sort of um, equivalent species in different types of amyloid may, have, may result in improvement. Um, we know that um, tofamidus, um, you know, Vindamax, um, reduced 
uh, the rate of death and hospitalizations due to cardiac events compared to placebo, um, although um, in, the, in the, the pivotal study that led to the approval, there still overall over time was worsening of um, symptoms. It just worsened at a slower pace, a significantly slower pace than placebo. Um, so, I mean, sometimes with the drugs that are available for uh, wild-type transthyretins, um, sometimes what you get is slowing of progression but not halting of progression, which is frustrating. And it's always hard to know, um, you know, if it's, it's, it's hard to get a precise measurement of how much it's been slowed. But, um, you know, we do, we do have a lot of patients, um, you know, who continue the medication in that situation. Uh, just um, hoping that it's it's um, more controlled than it otherwise would be, even though it's not perfectly controlled. All right, um, and that um, does. We are out of time now for any further questions. So I'm going to go ahead and uh, turn it back to Dr. Zonder for any closing comments that you might have. Thank you. Um, I hope that the um, I hope that the, the sli slide presentation was useful. Um, uh, some of those slides uh, I have used before. Some of them obviously were modified, uh, you know, just in the last uh, year or in, in the case of the Vutriceran uh, slides in the last three weeks, um, you know, uh, based on approvals. So, I mean, the, the, the data is constantly changing. Um, I would be happy to try and field some of the questions at least, maybe, um, I'm not sure all of them, but as many as I can of these other questions and uh, the answers can be circulated. Um, so if um, the organizers wanna just forward me a list of the questions we didn't get to, I will try to um, um, type out some answers that can be shared with the group. And I hope this was a helpful, uh, I hope this was helpful for everybody. Thank you, Dr. Zonder. And on behalf of the Amyloidosis Foundation, I would like to thank you for your participation in today's event. This concludes today's program. Thank you and have a great day. Thanks, everyone.